So now it is my privilege to introduce our speaker for this weekend. Abby Odio is here. Now, I've known Abby for about 15 years. We served on the same church staff back in California for a number of years, but she's originally from the Pacific Northwest. She's currently serving as a teaching pastor just down the road at Bethany Community Church in Seattle. And Abby is one of the most incredible pastors and leaders that I know and one of the most gifted communicators I have ever heard. So I have been looking forward to this weekend for a long, long time. So can you give like an obnoxiously loud welcome to Abby Odio right now? Let's welcome Abby up. You're the best. Hey, North Shore. Uh, I just am overjoyed to be here. To be honest, I've been looking forward to this uh, for a long time. What Scotty didn't tell you is that uh, 15 years ago, he was actually the first person who asked, uh, he was leading a ministry, young adults, several hundred people, to ask me to give a sermon. And um, I had not done this before, I had not preached before, and so I said yes, naturally, and I was terrified. And I got up there to give the message Totally, uh, not unprepared for the message, but the first words out of my mouth were totally unplanned. Uh, I made a joke about Scotty's height. I don't know where it came from or why, but I took the music stand and I said, I'm just a little taller than Scotty. Um, So not only do I have him to thank for um, just years of encouraging me in my calling and kind of coaching me, but also showing me tremendous grace and still inviting me back after all this time. Feel very grateful to him and Nina and by extension you all to be here. So you are partway through a timely series considering this question, what does it look like to live a life of less fear and more courage? What does it look like to live a life of less fear and more courage? Scotty kicked off this series a couple weeks back by naming the important truth that we are actually created to live lives of bravery, like we are wired for it. It's part of our DNA. And we are most ourselves, most the person God created us to be, when we are not controlled by our fear, but actually when we move into the world as people embodying courage. My husband, uh, Sam, and I, we have two young sons, our oldest of which um, he just turned, well, he's about to turn four. He's three, and his name is Mark, and big week in our house because Mark got his very first bicycle. And uh, we went out for a ride, uh, his first ride, actually, and kind of got him set up on the bike, and I'm feeling a bit nervous. He's not the bravest kid. I can tell he's feeling a bit nervous, and I really want this to go well, and um, It did initially, like he took off and I was so proud. I was getting my phone out, hoping I could get a quick picture, already planning my Instagram caption. Uh, Then it hits me that I talked to him about how to pedal. I talked to him uh, about how to steer. I had not talked to him about how to stop. And as I sort of realize this, Mark begins, I can hear him up ahead, and he starts to start nervously kind of crying out to me a little bit, and I run in this panic to catch up with him, which thankfully I do, and I sort of veer him off into the grass and, and get him stopped, and we're, we're both a bit shaken up, and I said, you know, but it's okay if you want to take a break. And um, really, that was code for, I need a break. Uh, and he looked at me, and it was the sweetest thing. He said, you know, Mom, I got a little scared when things were wibbly-wobbly, but I really want to try again. See, there's something in his little spirit. There's something that we see this in kids all the time, that they're wired for courage. They're wired to go through things and against all odds to keep showing up. There's something oriented in each of us towards this posture of courage. In some of the final moments before he goes to the cross, Jesus reiterated two things to his closest friends and followers. He knew things were about to get wibbly-wobbly, so to speak. And so he emphasized the most important sort of direction he could offer. He says this, love one another as I have loved you, and do not be afraid. Like he doubled down on those two truths, because he knew that when things got difficult for his disciples, in their fear, they would be tempted to revert back to self-preservation, whatever the cost. It's a very human response to difficulty. And he says, don't do it, don't buy in. He urges them, stay focused on love for one another, 
for your neighbor. That's your calling, that's your true north. And here's the thing, it's not gonna be easy. It's gonna require some courage. So don't be afraid. And as I contemplate those two commands, just reiterated, fear not and love one another, I can't think, help but think about how sort of wibbly wobbly the last 18 months has been for every single one of us in some way, shape or form. Job loss for some, deep grief for others. Isolation and mental health struggles for many, a long and overdue reckoning with racial injustice, marriage conflict, political upheaval and division, not just within our world and our sort of nation, but within churches, within families. At the community where I pastor over in Seattle, long-time small groups, like people who have loved each other for years through the hardest and best moments of life, they've parted ways. Parted ways because those people are too conservative and those people are too liberal. And in the middle of this climate that's just saturated with fear, it appears appears that some of the first things we've lost are the very things Jesus urged and beckoned his followers to remember. Like these have been the first casualties of the pandemic. Courage, love, hold on. And so today we lean into this essential question, what does it look like to live this life that we were created to live, which is a life of courageous love? And that question brings us to this short but really profound story in the Old Testament, the story of Ruth. Ruth is no stranger to difficult and wibbly-wobbly circumstances. The very first verse in the book of Ruth says this, in the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. That's a real important verse because it reveals to us something important about that particular era. If you were here or listened in last week online, you know that the time of Judges was a real low point in Israel's history, a time when the nation of Israel is increasingly divided, a time when Israel's customs and cultural mores are crumbling through systems of partisanship and division. It was a time when the pursuit of wealth and status and fame was just what you did. These were sort of the gold standards. And all of this gets ciphered into a recurring phrase that is the very last book, uh, verse in the book of Judges, which comes right before Ruth. It says this, everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Good thing times have changed. But of course, we know that they haven't. So let's keep going with Ruth's story. Early on, we meet another important character in Ruth's life, a woman named Naomi. Now, Naomi is originally from a place called Bethlehem, but came to Moab some 10 years ago with her husband and her two sons. This is sort of the backstory, it's important context, and then in the first chapter of the book, tragedy strikes, and Naomi's husband and both of her sons die. So this character, Naomi, is left in a severely vulnerable situation. She is stripped of every male attachment that would give her worth or protection or security in the ancient world. Understandably, then, Naomi makes the decision to return to her original home in Bethlehem, the only place where she'll literally have a chance at survival. Now enter Ruth. Ruth was married to one of Naomi's sons who has died. However, unlike Naomi, Ruth is not from Bethlehem in Judah. Ruth is a Moabite. Nonetheless, when Naomi decides to return home, both Ruth and Orpah, the other widowed daughter-in-law, they say, we'll go with you, we're in. And they do initially. But after traveling some distance, Naomi tells her daughter-in-laws to go back to their home in Moab, and she insists on this. She says, even if there was still hope for me, And these words of Naomi, they realize, they help us to see that Naomi is at a place where she is convinced all hope is lost. So I love this, Orpah, the the other daughter-in-law, she's like, cool, see ya, bye, it's been fun. But Ruth, Ruth assumes a different posture. The text tells us, but Ruth clung to her. That word clung, it's really important. The Hebrew word here is debak, and it translates to be joined together, to cling to, or to keep close. This is the same verb that is used in Genesis chapter two when God declares, a man shall leave his parents and cling to the woman and they shall become one flesh. Notice the word doesn't just imply a closeness, like being side by side, it implies a oneness. 
And so the first truth we learn from Ruth about a courageous life is that it clings to spaces of perceived hopelessness. A courageous life clings to places of perceived hopelessness. Notice in this moment, Ruth does not have all the answers. She does not know how to fix Naomi's predicament. She has no clue what they'll encounter when they get to Bethlehem. But what she does know, what she is relentlessly committed to, is the truth that redemption and hope in the human story always begins with debauch, always begins with clinging, with becoming one. This is why in the very first chapter of John's Gospel, which is a story of redemption of all of humankind, he begins with the words, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Do you see the connection? Jesus clings to by becoming one of us. There's a great theologian named Dietrich Bonhoeffer and he writes about this idea of becoming one with, clinging, and he uses the language of giving. He says, we often think of giving as something uh, we kind of offer each other occasionally, like a gift here or a donation there. But Bonhoeffer argues that instead, giving is actually the primary relationship that we share with one another. It's the elemental desire to transform isolation and self-centeredness into caring. In other words, it's showing up with your friend and sitting next to them in their chemo appointment. It's about learning how injustice rears its evil head in my neighborhood and then standing with the vulnerable that is holy work. It's asking someone you know who's struggling with anxiety, how are you feeling right now? And then having the presence and the patience to just sit and listen. And friends, part of the tragedy of the human story is that we give great energy and time and resources not to answering the question, to whom can I cling, to whom can I connect, but rather to answering the question, how can I stand out? Not who do I stand with? A writer by the name of David Brooks recently came out with a book called The Second Mountain, and the thesis of this book is that a person generally has two mountains in their lives. The first mountain tends to be kind of the normal goals of our culture, uh, you know, to be perceived as successful, to uh, get an invite to the right parties and social gatherings, to uh, have a nice family and nice vacations, things like that. And then Brooks writes, a, a valley usually happens in a person's life. A diagnosis, a job loss, a divorce, something that Brooks claims breaks open a deeper part of ourselves. And when that happens, some of you know this valley, some of you are in this valley. Ruth knew this valley really well, but when that happens, ever so slowly, our posture, our decisions, our politics, our lives begin to change. Suddenly we become less driven by ego and more driven by a rich and weathered empathy that actually puts others above ourselves. We learn to cling to instead of run from perceived areas of hopelessness. So Ruth's story invites us to reflect on that question, to whom do we cling? How are we courageously moving into spaces of perceived hopelessness? I love what you all are doing on August 22nd. What a great opportunity, not just to say, we're for this community, but to step into the community, to become one with, to, to move alongside. So with that in mind, we, we move to the second really profound reality that we see in Ruth's story, which is this, a courageous life will call us to take meaningful risk in the name of love. A courageous life will call us to take meaningful risk in the name of love. See, returning to Ruth, we see that after cleaving to Naomi, Ruth makes this beautiful proclamation to her. She says this, do not press me to leave you or turn back from following you. Where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. There I will be buried. May the Lord do thus and so to me, and more as well, if even death parts me from you. Now, it's important to pause and acknowledge what it is that Ruth is committing to in this moment. This relocation, it wasn't benign. It wasn't like, you know, moving from Kirkland over to Seattle. Some of you are thinking, I would never. 
But Ruth's people, the Moabites, uh, and the people of Judah, which is where Bethlehem was located, these two groups, they had a long and hateful history towards one another, which actually goes back to the time of Abraham some 1,000 years before. Some of you will remember Abraham and his nephew Lot. They're real important characters in the Bible. Um, God calls Abraham to take his family and to live out this grand mission of revealing God's redemption to the world. But shortly into this great mission, there is conflict between Abraham and Lot, having to do with sheep, naturally. Um, So in a matter of about a single chapter, God's people are divided. Abraham goes left, Lot goes right. And Lot ends up fathering a son, uh, actually through an incestuous relationship with his daughter. You can read all about that in Genesis 19. The name of Lot's son will sound familiar. That's right, it's Moab. Ruth is a descendant of Lot's people. Meanwhile, Abraham's descendants become the people of Israel, the very same people who are now living in Bethlehem. There was no love lost between these two groups. 1,000 years later, the conflict is still deep. It's hostile. We see this in scripture. In the book of Numbers, we read where the, the Moabites launch curses at the wandering Israelites. In Deuteronomy, it's noted that the Moabites were not to be included in the worshiping assembly. All of this means Ruth is not just leaving her people and her home to go with Naomi. She is entering territory territory that will leave her exposed and vulnerable. Moabites did not move to Bethlehem. Simply put, this is a courageous and risky act of love. It will require she give something of herself, her future, her comfort, her image. I'll unfortunately never forget the really uh, terribly awkward moment where um, my now husband Sam and I first told one another that we loved each other. Some of you maybe have experienced this joy in your own story. Um, But we were sitting on the couch at my apartment. This was many years ago. And I said to Sam, you know, I have something I want to tell you, but it feels hard and risky and I'm just not really sure how to say it. I feel nervous. And I was hoping, of course, that this would prompt him um, to say it first. And then, of course, I could follow suit in kind of the safety of knowing that we were on the same page. But he didn't. And um, so I worked up the courage and I I said it. I said, you know, I love you and I want to tell you what that means to me. And the love of my life looked at me and he responded with a single word. He said, thanks. And then he let the suspense linger for a few hours before calling me on his way home to say, indeed, he felt the same way and loved me too. At which point I informed him that I had since changed my mind. (laughs) But you get the point of the illustration. Love, real love, by its very nature is risky. Like Ruth, it puts us in a position where we're exposed. We open ourselves up to increasing risk, a Moabite in Bethlehem. And Ruth exam- Ruth's example raises this question for us. As we pursue lives of courage, where are we taking such risks? I have to tell you, I was deeply con- uh, convicted as I reflected on that question this week, just in my own story. How easy it is for me to hear statistics like there are 21 million people living as modern day slaves. That's more than the population of New York, London, and Los Angeles combined. 21 million people, how easy it is for me to hear that without asking how my own consumption and spending patterns actually keep that industry well afloat. You see, to acknowledge and enter that reality is risky. I may have to sacrifice something, change something, live differently, spend my money differently. How easy it is for me to see a lonely person on our street without stopping to engage them in conversation. Something as simple as just saying, hey, what's your name? It's risky. I may have to give up 10 minutes of my day. I may have to participate in an awkward conversation. How easy it is for me to mourn the reality of racism without ever asking hard questions about how my own privilege might be implicitly part of the problem. It's risky. I may have to step outside the safety of my pride, my defenses. I may have to concede that I am part of a broken system that actually benefits me. It's not comfortable. Now, keeping that in mind, one of the profound and important realities we observe in this little story is that as Ruth takes steps of risky love towards the other, as she moves into unsettling and unknown territory, 
Ruth finds that she herself is mysteriously cared for. As the story continues, Ruth and Naomi arrive in Bethlehem at the beginning of barley season. This is good news. It means there's not a famine happening in Bethlehem. And Ruth goes to the field. She finds um, a, a wealthy man named Boaz. She goes to his field and she gathers the grain that's left behind by the harvesters. This act was called gleaning. It was part of Israelite law that reapers actually leave behind part of their crop for the poor like Ruth and Naomi. This is what keeps them alive. They're able to eat. And Boaz takes notice of Ruth and he offers her additional protection from anyone who would cause her harm. From there, Ruth and Naomi scheme a plan for Ruth to get married to Boaz, and this involves Ruth going and lying at the feet of Boaz after he's had a big meal and lots to drink. One biblical scholar noted that there's no way to actually know what's going on with the feet in this encounter. Um, that biblical scholar must have been Southern Baptist because I won't say too much here except that feet uh, are a euphemism in Hebrew culture for something else, which makes this a very intimate encounter of sorts. And over time, thanks to Naomi's wise friendship and counsel, Ruth actually marries Boaz. They have a baby together, securing a future for Ruth, where before there was only vulnerability and unknowns and risk. In Ruth chapter two, after Boaz's initial act of kindness, Naomi wisely sums up God's posture towards them, saying this, blessed be he by the Lord, whose kindness has not forsaken the living for the dead. That word translated here as kindness is really an important word. In Hebrew, the word is hesed, and it means loyal, enduring, relentlessly committed in love. A love that chases down, never gives up. A, a love you couldn't escape from even if you tried. Now, why does this matter? Hear this important detail in the story. As Ruth moves away from her homeland, away from comfort and predictability, towards Naomi with risky, vulnerable, courageous love, God is moving towards Ruth, holding Ruth in the truest, purest expression of that very love. And Ruth, because she takes this courageous risk, actually encounters the love of God in a way she would not have known if she stayed in Moab. One of my favorite authors is the late Toni Morrison. She's actually a woman of deep and profound faith. In her novel, Paradise, Mo Morrison prophetically describes love this way. She writes this, love is divine only and difficult always. If you think it's easy, you are a fool. If you think it's natural, you are blind. It is a learned application without reason or motive except that it is God. I love that line. In other words, we can only do the hard and risky work of loving well because of the divine, because of God, because of his said, because we have a source of love that we do not have to internally manufacture. And friends, in a similar way, what we find is we cling to areas of perceived hopelessness with risky love in our, in our schools and in our communities. As we let go of our own ego, our own need for comfort, we find we're pursued by that same hesed. We learn that those things which we thought were the source of our life, our image, our privilege, now we realize they're not so important. I find myself mysteriously cared for, cared about, secure in another love. Perhaps this is what Jesus meant when he offered this little phrase, those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. When I was in college, I spent a summer working at a camp for folks who had various intellectual and physical disabilities. And one of the events that summer was a high ropes course, which is basically, you know, a, a um, course that's like 40 feet up in the air with all these different challenges. And as campers worked through the course, they were always wearing a full harness. And that harness was attached to a cable so that even if they fell or slipped, which happened somewhat often, they were, they were connected. And I'll never forget this, this one camper who came, uh, we'll call her Abby because that was her name. And um, she was scared to get up on the course. And there was an adult leader with her and that adult, um, I watched from kind of where I was and that adult helped her to put on the harness and she explained to her, this harness will keep you attached. This harness will keep you attached. 
And so after a few of these pep talks, Abby worked up the courage and she started moving through the course. And I'll never forget every, literally every step she took on that course, she said, I'm attached, I'm attached. And her voice was sort of shaking a bit and you could tell that this was more of a reminder to herself than anything. And then she came to the very last section of the course, which is close to where I was standing. And there's a series of logs she had to cross to get to the other side. And she took the first step, I'm attached. I'm attached. And then she proceeded and that next step, her foot slipped and Abby let out this shriek of fear as she free fell for just a moment. And then the ropes did what they're supposed to do and they caught her. And so Abby looked up at all of us and in a very different, very confident, very joyful tone, she announced to everyone, I'm attached. Like she'd mostly believed it, but she didn't really believe it until the moment the ropes caught her. I love that story. It so gets at Ruth's experience. It so illustrates the life that God is calling you to and he's calling me to, to take courageous steps of love. And as we do so, we realize what was true all along, but that what we can never learn in a place of comfort. I'm attached. There's a, a hased love that so defines and holds my life that I need not be afraid that I will actually know God in a way I don't know God now as I take loving and meaningful risk. It's profound. That brings us to our third and final point, which is this, a courageous life transforms the world. A courageous life transforms the world. I wanna take a moment and sort of zoom out of this story of Ruth for just a second. We've been reading Ruth as this kind of encouraging, you know, little narrative about a rather ordinary family living an ordinary ancient life. Tragedy, famine, movement, it's all happening there. But at the very end of this story, the narrator moves from an on the ground view of events to a 35,000 foot view of what's happening here. Um, of how Ruth is actually a critical turning point in the entire story of God's plan to redeem the world. At the, uh, as the book ends, you get this little two-verse genealogy that says this, Boaz of Obed, Obed of Jesse, Jesse of David. Now, you'll remember we talked about that drama between Abraham and Lot that divided God's people. And Ruth is a descendant of Lot. Her people and the Israelites were utter enemies. This means that when Ruth returns to Bethlehem, to Israel, with Naomi, and when Ruth marries Boaz and has a child named Obed, at a 35,000 foot view, this is actually the first time in 1,000 years of biblical history that Lot's tribe and Abraham's tribe are reunited. In other words, through Ruth's act of clinging to Naomi and through her risky act of love that led her into the unknown territory, what you thought was just a small story about the courage of two widowed refugees was actually the story of how two widowed refugees united an entire nation. It's actually the story of transformation on this worldwide level. See, if we go back to the story of Abraham Lot in Genesis 12, the word used to describe the division is this little Hebrew word, parad. It just simply means to separate. Abraham and Lot, they paraded. They, they separated. Parad gets used only one time in Ruth's story, and it comes in those beautiful words she speaks to Naomi, where you die, I will die. May the Lord do thus to me and more also if death parades you and me. You could also say if death detaches you and me. Here's the point. For 1,000 years between Abraham and Ruth, things were not right among God's people. God's people were detached from their story of redemption. But now, because of Ruth, things are finally back on track. No longer is there parade. No longer is there detachment. Now comes Boaz of Obed, Obed of Jesse, Jesse of David, a family line that in another 1,000 years in the future will give birth to a baby in the same town called Bethlehem to another family on the run for their survival of Mary and Joseph, and his name will be Jesus. <laughs> Y'all are fun. We don't do this in Seattle, so this is fun for me. See, I imagine that Ruth did not know on that day by clinging to her in-law and refusing to parade, to detach, that she was becoming the centerpiece of God's unfolding story in the world. No idea. 
I imagine that Ruth did not know her risky and faithful love of Naomi was actually the beginning of reconciling a 1,000-year-old feud from the past and the beginning of a new story, a new lineage that in another 1,000 years would give birth to the savior of all human history. I imagine instead that Ruth saw Naomi in her suffering and knew she needed someone to hold her close, to be with her, to remind her she was not alone. I imagine Ruth was just doing the faithful thing, the human thing, the loving thing that was right in front of her on that day, in that moment. And then I I think about all of you, and I I think about me, I think about this church and, and this part of the world, and man, the times that we are living in that are so, so difficult. If you're like me in the overwhelming parade and division and separation of the world, it's tempting to think that our own lives of faith don't matter all that much, that we can hardly influence history in any sort of hopeful direction, or it's tempting to think that here in this wonderful part of the world that we live in, only great and brilliant and innovative gestures count for anything in the end. But if Ruth teaches us anything, if she shows us anything, it's that ordinary people making courageous everyday decisions are the ones who transform history, the people that God uses. Maybe this week you're called to love someone with a, a small act of risky love, someone in your school or someone who's part of your family, to cling to them, to show up for them, call them on the phone to reach out to an estranged relative, to stand humbly with someone in their suffering, to listen to someone you don't entirely agree with, to extend hospitality to a stranger. And who knows, maybe that small act of human kindness and love, the one that's right in front of you, maybe that action will get swept up into this much larger story of transformation that God is writing in the world. In fact, it will, and that's the promise that God's given us. And maybe, just maybe, thousands of courageous choices being made right here within the community of North Shore will create a ripple effect that echoes tones of redemption into all eternity. Friends, may our hopes be set on that end and may our lives be courageous enough to pursue it. By the grace of Jesus, may we live lives of courage. Let's pray together. Jesus, we thank you that in that moment when life was difficult, when circumstances were hard beyond belief, that you did not back down from love and you did not back down from courage. Thank you that you walked willingly to the cross on our behalf. Jesus, may we receive that into our story in this moment as the act of courageous love that it is. May we find ourselves this morning, wherever we are, from wherever we are listening, firmly planted in your Hesed love. No matter what we've done, no matter what our past is, no matter the struggles we face even this morning, God, we are there, we are yours. And Jesus, I pray that that would not be the end of our story, but from that place, from this place of just knowing and being deeply rooted and planted, we would have the same courage that you had to lovingly face the world, to take risks on behalf of the other, to see people in their human dignity, to let our defenses down a little bit. God, the greatest story of the gospel is that you have protected us. We do not have to protect ourselves. You have protected us by the cross and we can stand in that as victors. God, help us to be courageous from that place. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your church. Pray these things in Jesus' name.